So, hi everyone. Um, and uh, this is one of the, this is kind of, I've ended up in a lecture theater at the, uh, when I'm nearly 60, rather than when I was, uh, when I should have been, when I was 19 or 20, I guess. So I've uh, eventually made it to a lecture theater, um, which is kind of cool, uh, because we, I started off, well, you'll probably get, you, you probably realize this soon enough, but I have no qualifications and no training at all in horticulture or ecology or pretty much anything I'm going to talk about today. Um, so some of it might, some of it will be, you know, some of it's going to be guesswork, um, but I do tend to qualify the guesswork by saying, well, this is what's in my head. I'm not quite sure whether it's true, but this is what's in my head. So look out for that because uh, that may not be true. Um, but uh, I think in some ways, uh, looking at things um, without that training, although I'm, I, I do miss that now and I do regret uh, now I'm doing more talks and I'm in, you know, in, meeting a lot more people. I wish I had more of that basic training, but in some respects it's freed me up maybe to think slightly outside the protocol, which I guess uh, has done me a favor. Um, so I'm just gonna attempt to... <laughs> First slide. <laughs> Hey, okay. No, it's, it's always good to have a bit of techie problems. I don't think I've ever been, have anyone been to a lecture or I've been to a, a talk without, there's always a minor techie problem with that. And, and I'm not quite sure, it's a bit weird seeing a little picture, a window of myself in the corner as well. Can you, and you have to look at that as well. Is the, is the online lot have to look at that? Yeah, they yeah. do, oh dear. Okay. So, um, I, first thing I'd like to say, I guess, is that I am not a sort of top shore top soil fascist. I'm not, um, I'm not suggesting in any way that you, you rip all your top soil out and, and get rid of it all because it's a heat, a terrible thing and you, you've got to lose it. It's not true. Um, what I'm suggesting is on the back of development and highways and uh, new landscapes and a lot of uh, uh, certainly bigger schemes, the top soil is removed as a matter of course. So if you, if, you, if you see a new development, a new housing development, they scrape all the topsoil off, and they bung it in a heap in the corner, ready to put back on top of everything else. So what I'm suggesting is that at that point, or pr preferably before that point, we decide whether the topsoil is the best material to go blanket everything with. And what I'm trying to suggest is I don't think it is, because there's many, many, uh, uh, landscapes and uh, and especially um, from a biodiversity point of view, there's many circumstances where you don't really want fertile topsoil. So um, I was just uh, mentioning earlier to Tim that um, from if if if, uh, if you're just trying if you're out just at the outset of your training and you're looking at um, moving into um, landscape architecture or green infrastructure or anything like that, I think, I think it's a very positive time. It's a really scary time but it's a really positive time because i think there's lots of amazing opportunities on the back of this huge amount of development that we had um, going on to influence the landscape that we leave when these things are finished and i don't think we should ever underestimate how amazing a landscape can be very very quickly if you design it with a bit of creativity it can be an incredibly good for wildlife very, very early days. And I think this is a really optimistic thing. And I think we've missed this a little bit. So we've been, a, we've been, a, 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 we, we are, a, you know, we are a, a country of, of gardeners and we're also people that have been incredibly good at uh, volunteering and, and conserving the environments that we have, the important environments, the ancient woodlands, the old meadows, all those sort of things. We're really good at keeping those as they are, that's fine but the potential to increase biodiversity is in the new landscape on the back of development. And that's where I think the really exciting things can happen. Find one of these guys. This is the other thing to do when you're thinking about your, your landscape, find an entomologist, latch onto an entomologist because they are genius people. Sometimes a bit tricky to get, you know, you, it's quite tricky sometimes to go out and have a a banging night with these guys straight away, right? <laughs> but they are genius people. And this is James, who's my, well, very close friend now, amazing guy. And if you can, if, if, I think we should be, we should be, entomologists should be integrated into the design of new landscapes because 
if you get the entomology right, and if you design for invertebrates and make that work, you're gonna get most of the other biodiversity for free. You don't have to worry about that so much. If, you, if you've got an amazingly diverse um, a, 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 a species list of invertebrates, you're gonna get a lot of the other stuff coming on the back of it. And what entomologists normally, well, in fact, normally they don't even, they don't have entomologists in, do they? Because they only really, really interested in newts and bats and lizards and I don't know, some of this, you know, the stuff that we've got some sort of legal obligation to. Um, but, and we spend loads of money, don't we, on um, employing uh, ecologists to look at the landscape before development and before highways, don't we? So we pump money into, say, go and find out what's on the site Tell me what they all are because we're going to smash them to pieces anyway. We're going to re we're going to remove them all anyway, but we're going to spend loads of money finding out what's there just to understand what we're going to demolish and get rid of. Now I know there's mitigation and I know there's some compensation, but I know they move a few newts around. But let's be honest: at the end of the day, we're not doing masses. That's not doing loads of good, is it? If we took that money and spent that money in employing entomologists and ecologists in the design of the landscape that's that's put back. That's, to my mind, where all the money should be. And then you can really start to make a difference because you could probably make the landscape better than it was before if you, if, if you have a bit of uh, thought into it. So love and entomology is always good. So what, I, what struck me in my naive kind of untrained mind was where is all the best, where are all the wildlife? Where's the, the best site for wildlife? And brownfield sites, as you probably know, uh, you probably know, are jet. I mean, obviously this is a broad term, but on the whole, a lot of brownfield sites are incredibly good for wildlife. Way better than farms fields. Way better. Uh, and this place, I don't know if anyone has been to Canvey Wick. This is down my way, Canvey, and uh, third most important site in the country for vertebrates. And uh, one of my uh, students who's working with me at the moment uh, found this quote as well. Again, don't take this as red. Um, she, she told me this was out. I can't, I can't remember what publications it's from. More biodiversity per square foot than any other site <laughs> in the UK. <clears throat> Can be wick, right? So this is a this is a, a, a oil refinery left for seventy years, and now look what happens. Do you know what I mean? So. What is it about these places that makes them so good? And it, we should understand what makes them so good. And then we should design that into our new landscapes. So we should keep the brownfield as a template for our new landscapes. So this is where I'm lucky enough to live. Uh, and as you can see, probably got a, you've got a feel for what I try and do. So <clears throat> we trial all sorts of materials, all sorts of brownfield materials, and which we, we, we um, uh, I have an opportunity to trial stuff here before it goes out into public space. Because there's nothing worse than that kind of bullshit greenwash that, that's kicking around uh, where we make these kind of, you know, this is definitely better biodiversity. We, we had it ourselves a bit where we got, we got an award for biodiversity for a, the cycle shelters that we made. It gave us the award for biodiversity, which was lovely, really nice. But there was, they, they, we, they had no idea that our bike shelters were good for biodiversity. You know what I mean? So I think if you can start trialing it and try try checking stuff, and then you can be much more um, sure of it. I mean, instinctively, there's a lot of things that we can definitely do that we know are going to be good. You don't necessarily have to check those, but there has to be some honesty. I think with a lot of a lot of the green initiatives and a lot of our ideas it has to have some honesty about it. So that's where I live, and that's why I'm lucky enough. So we trial all sorts of stuff there. So what I'm going to talk about, and I know it's posted as um, um, uh, alternatives to topsoil, the talk, this, the, the, what I'm talking about tonight. But since uh, probably over the last two or three years, especially, I've, I've really been fascinated by how structural um, diversity and structural complexity are as important, if not more important sometimes than the plants and the, and the green landscape. And, and it feels like we've missed, we've really not taken, when we're designing a new landscape, it's the structure that makes things good. So the reason that biodiversity is so good in, in, on brownfield is because it's got a load of our rubbish, a load of our waste, a load of our structural materials. Do you know what I mean? That is where all the wildlife are because that's where the hibernation is, that's where the breeding space is, that's where the nesting space is, that's all 
are vitally important. And you can see from this is a picture of my place. And, uh, you know, there's loads and loads of stuff happening inside those cars. And, and, and uh, there's always, uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't rake everything flat, you make sure there's topography in your landscape, that is going to increase your diversity and, and make your, your site so much more exciting. So I'll be talking about structure to the start and then soils as we go through it. So um, here's a piece of structural complexity, a shopping trolley in a, in a pond. Now, you know, I mean, I know that's kind of the most abhorrent thing, isn't it, to us? I don't know, there's something about that. So I don't know why that's so jarring. There's something about taking a supermarket trolley from the supermarket and putting it in a pond that feels so bad. And, um, and, there's, and, and you, could, you could get a thousand volunteers, couldn't you, on a Sunday to take that out. It would be a, we, we definitely want to take that out, wouldn't we? But, have a look what it's doing, isn't it? It's trapping material, it's, it's giving cover. It's doing all the things, for instance, that shipwrecks do for scuba divers, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Where are all the fish? Where's all the wildlife? It's all on the shipwreck and all around it, there's nothing. You know what I mean? And so what we should be doing, I think, is saying, okay, this is good. We know this is good isn't it? And, and therefore, we, but we can design this to look good. Right, so it doesn't have to be a shopping trolley, it can be a stainless steel sculpture, or it could be anything that, do you know what I mean? So we can get an aesthetic in it, but we shouldn't ignore these things are really good. And there's a survey done, um, there's a, a work done uh, by a student uh, last year, I think it was, there's a link here, uh, where uh, she proved there was more biodiversity in the litter on the embankments and on the riverbank than there was in the other part of the, uh, the so-called natural vegetation and, and places. So we, you know, I, I know litter is a bad thing and I know we don't shouldn't want to throw it around, but it it's actually replacing our natural structure that we are removing, aren't we? So we tidy up all our natural mess and structure and fallen trees and standing dead and all those things. We remove all that. Uh, and litter and our waste is actually replacing some of that. So Here's the thing. Um, I would say, and again, this is me guessing, right? I would say if you left that there for three or four years, you'd have more biodiversity in that than you would do in that patch of cow parsley over there or in that part of the hedgerow, I would say, right? Because you've got probably three or four different soils in there. You've got topography, you've got damp, you've got dry, you've got tons of niches and voids for mammals, for bumblebees to nest, for all sorts of things to do. You've got masses of complexity in that. That will be become very, very interesting from a biodiversity point of view, I'd say. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that we go around fly tipping, but we, we need to understand that that is what we're missing out of a lot of our new design work. It's not the plants necessarily. We're doing loads of plants for pollen and nectar. And every, everyone in the world's good doing pollen and nectar now. Like you, can't, you can't move for pollen and nectar, can you? You know what I mean? So we've got enough of that stuff. We've, generally, we've got enough of the, the food. It's what we haven't got is the structural um, complexity that, that, that allows for hibernation and nesting and all those other things. So what we've been trialing is, and of course, Again, the thing with, with the fly tip is that looks terrible, right? We, we know that's good, I'd say, but it looks terrible. So how can we make that better? So what we've, tr what we've looked at is taking waste material. Now, most of these bits of material you can see here was what you'd get left over often from building and development. Didn't you? So this stuff normally would go in the skip. But what you don't want, obviously, you don't want to just design something like that that looks terrible and go, oh, here's your new landscape around your new housing estate. You know, it's brilliant for wildlife, but it looks a bit terrible. Um, you can, but you can bury all this stuff and you can disguise all this stuff. And we just, what we did basically, we did this and then we put um, uh, some waste brick on top. Now that's not, you know, that's not the most cutting edge design, but it, it certainly is probably be an acceptable thing once it's, and it could be planted and, and people would be happy, okay about it. Um, what we, but the, these sort of spaces, these voids and these kind of complex mix of waste materials are really called for. So we've been, uh, we, we've tried, we're trying this. So at the end of these bits of water pipe, um, 
we're hoping to get bumblebees that are nests that under here. Um, so we're trialing um, some old uh, mice and vole nests at the, at the ends of some of these pipes. Because again, tell me if I'm wrong, but someone told me that um, bumblebees find old mice nests from, uh, with smell. So they smell old mouse nests that they love to nest in. So some of these pipes have got old um, vole nests at the end of them and some haven't. So we're gonna trial that and just see how that makes sense whether that makes sense. But it, I, either way, you know, we've got bumblebee opportunities. We've got loads of space for, this is gonna be full of small mammals, isn't it? Voles, shrews, they're gonna love that stuff under there. Um, really, really important. And it struck me, because we're, we're always, um, I'm, we're, we're, we're working towards, hoping to work towards a, a handbook to, to, to kind of uh, share all this stuff. and. Uh, I was desperate to try and find some sort of unit of habitat, for want of a better phrase. Um, and um, I think uh, gabions, we use gabions a lot, always have done, are the, one of the most useful landscape tools. So we could use a gabion, couldn't we, as a, as a unit of uh, habitat. So as you're filling it, you can add in your foal voyage, you can add in some space for bumblebees, you can add in dry materials, you can put sheet material that keeps uh, things dry. Uh, you can do all those things. Um, and it's encased in, a, in, a, in a, a, a steel cage, very cheap, very lightweight, relatively low carbon to make. You can get you know, thousands and hundreds and hundreds of these to site very easily, very, very cheaply. And then you could fill it with all sorts of interesting materials. And as soon as you put it in a square box and make it nice and neat, make sure you get these lovely and level, make sure they're beautifully in line. Then you can put as much rubbish in them as you like because people accept it then because it's an, in, a, in a beautifully square level unit. You know what I mean? So this is local uh, rubble, um, not gabion stone. Because gabion stone usually comes from miles away out of a mine source, incredibly high uh, carbon and energy to get it there. We don't need that. We can use things that, that don't look that good on their own, but if you put them in a neat box, they look okay. So I think gabions we could use. So this is a scheme that uh, uh, we've just been doing with, with a, a local car park, which I will talk about later because I'm slightly obsessed about car parks now after this, <laughs> um, where we used we had a 40, we only had, it was 150 car car park. We only had 40,000 pounds to do the whole car park. Because obviously they'd spent 2 million pounds on the visitor center, obviously. Yeah, so 2 million pounds on the visitor center, 40,000 for the landscape. That's about, you know, your average kind of pathetic. Um, uh, uh, anyway, I'll try not to go into that. Um, these are some of the, I don't expect you to read these now, but these are some of the very exciting things about gabions. <laughs> okay, so if you have time <laughs> later, you can read those because um, they make so much sense. So um, very, very useful uh, things. So they add structures so and you've then got basking areas. You've got great places for lizards. You can plant the top, put some soil in them. You could do all those things are happening within that. And they're, they're a retaining wall. They're a fence. They're a functional thing. And it's that lovely thing of, making a, a very a, a thing that, 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 that has to function to do something, getting that, get the stuff we have to have, getting those things to do more than they're, they're originally designed for, to become a wildlife haven, to become a, an important place for wildlife, as well as storing bins, or as well as storing bikes, or as well as being a boundary. You know what I mean? I think we need to really uh, try and work on that. And you can put plants in the top, obviously. You know? And you can put more walls and you can drill holes in logs and make it for bees. Now, this is the thing that I quite like. Um, you know, these, this is a lovely, you know, lovely old uh, uh, hedge bank, you know, traditional hedge bank, um, traditionally made obviously with, as a dry stone wall, um, craftsman, you know, a lot of tradition gone into it. Beautiful things, aren't they? When you think about it from a biodiversity point of view, because you've got a bank of stone, a dry stone wall, brilliant for wildlife, and then you've got a hedge on top, even good, better for wildlife. So when you think about it, this thing is doing, if that was just a hedge planted in the ground, it would not be as good, I'm guessing. These, this makes it extra good, doesn't it, by giving that extra bit of, uh, 
Now we could do all that. We could do away with the traditional skills. We could do away with the craftsmen, couldn't we? We could just put a gabby on either side and we could fill the center in with soil and we could plant the hedge. I, I mean, I'm talking about in, in South Essex where I live, obviously there isn't a tradition of dry stone warning. Um, so we could have an Essex dry stone wall and we could plant a hedge on it. So I think, you know, we, we, we've, it's, it's so exciting to look at this, the structural elements of, of uh, architecture and of landscape and of, of, of hard infrastructure and try and make it uh, work for wildlife. And you can uh, do plant, these, these are plants for bees and stuff. More gabion, more gabion ideas. Uh, so this is what I was sort of suggesting. So you've got to have somewhere to put your bikes. Okay, so it's, you know, it's a lot of work to make a bike shelter. You might as well make that little bit extra effort and put um, breeding space, nesting space on the side, and obviously plants and soils on the roof. Makes perfect sense. But if you're going to put plants and soils on the roof, make sure you put at least 150 millimeters of soil there. Don't put a little pissy piece of seed and mat on there and go, oh, I've done a green roof. That's great. I've, I'm going to save the world because it just sits. It, it, but if you do that, it, you know, see the mat just sits there, isn't it? But years and years kind of clinging onto life. Give it some, put some soil on it. It's so easy to design a building to take extra weight. You know, don't don't go down that trap of of, of being the, the 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 kind of minimum green roof always. You know, we we'll make it as light as possible because that's vaguely cheaper it's hardly any difference in cost making a building strong enough to, to support a decent green roof than it is to support a piece of cedar it really is bins here's another place you know i mean and also the other thing about these places they're places that people have to go to don't they so bureau bins you know these things are great and they, they all, you you know everyone has to take their trash out and put it in there you've got them then right they're going to this bid every day or every few days that's the time to get people to say, look, here's an exciting thing you could use back in your garden, or here's a piece of interpretation that, that explains what we're doing. Here's plants on top of your bin shot. You know, here's a joyous thing to make you feel better about putting your rubbish in the bin. And uh, this is uh, one of my good mates, Wendy Allen, and she does exciting things with water coming off of roofs. And uh, again, it's all about making everyday infrastructure become exciting and become important. And this is very much about saying to people, look, this water's coming off the roof. What are you going to do with it? Where's it going to go? You know, what we, what's it about? But think about it. If that just came off on a straight down pipe into a drain, no one would even think about it. This stuff makes people think, which um, is good. But, um, so that's a good SUD scheme, right? That's a really good SUD scheme. Um, but there's loads of really bad sud schemes, which you probably, I'm sure you've, you, you're probably aware of. Here's a really bad sud scheme. This was on, this was foisted on me on my housing estate in Hackney in East London. And uh, they, they uh, dug a hole in the pavement. They put some, some sud stuff underneath. And then they dumped a load of sticky, rich, rich topsoil on top. And then went, okay, we're going to rewild it now, right? So they're going to rewild it. You know, they haven't got, you know, I don't know, a thousand hectares like net, but they, they've got a tiny piddly little place on a housing estate. Put rich topsoil on, don't do anything to it. Let it rewild, great. Bramble, Canadian flea vein, coarse grass, nets, right? Okay, fine. They're all okay for wildlife, right? But we've got tons of that in Hackney, haven't we? We don't want more of that. We want... We want different things to that because that's everywhere in Hackney. And look how terrible that is for the people that lived on my estate. What, you know, having that stuck outside their house. But it's good for biodiversity. No, it's not. No, it's definitely not. It's useless in comparison to what it could have been if you had used low fertility soils on top of that sud scheme. And of course, famously, it doesn't even drain. Look, there's a huge puddle here, right? So it doesn't even function. Anyway, I've got to stop. But, the, it, it, why, uh, the only thing I'm highlighting is the uh, don't don't let's not get drawn into the arrogance of, of dumping the latest fad onto people that live there without talking to them and make it, and, and 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 having some respect. This is just middle class bollocks. You know what I mean? It really is. I mean, it, you know, that's just not fair. 
it's just not fair. And it's and it's and it's everything that that these kind of new greening thing is 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 it's bad. Okay, here's some pretty pictures. So this is a this is what else roots can do. So they obviously they function to do all those other things. And of course, because I've been doing green roots for so long, green roots we dictate the soil, don't we, on a roof? Always. So I, I, I suppose I've always been used to being able to decide what soil I want because obviously with a green roof, you pick the soil you want because you, you know, there's no natural, there's no nat obviously naturally there'd be no soil. Um, so, and um, you can do so many cool things with, with green roofs if you do it. This has got a wetland roof, so the flat bit is a wetland roof where we just, all we do is we just lift the outlet up for 100 mil. So we just bung something under the outlet, lift it up 100 mil, then 100 mil of water stays in there before it goes out the dome pipe. That's all we do. And then you get a wetland roof and a dry roof. Okay, so you've immediately, uh, you know, widened the biodiversity potential of this case. Here's a nice thing. Um, so I guess what I, I guess all along, the whole way along this is all gonna be about protocol and about what we've always accepted and, and rethinking it slightly, you know? So here's a bird hide. Now, there's loads of these, isn't there, right? Now, do you feel inclined to walk into that? I mean, do you feel, yeah, look at that, whoa, that's great. I'm going right in that, that's really looking good. I bet that's gonna be, that's gonna be so exciting when I get in there, you know? Um, and even if you, you know, even if you, anyway, it's just, it's fine. It functions. You see what I mean? It functions, but it does nothing else, does it? And uh, the Wildlife Trust asked us to um, uh, design a bird hive for them, mainly because the last three had been burnt down. That was the main reason, of course, because they get burnt down as well. But uh, so we looked at it, and this is what we built for them. So what we said was, first thing we said was, don't worry about the bird hide. We're not designing it for twitches. We're not designing it for twitches because they'll come anyway. Um, and, you know, they don't spend much in the visit centers. They bring a flask. And, <laughs> and so, but no, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say is we, we need to design things for, you know, we know the twitch is going to come, right? And they're a valued member of, the, of, of things. But, but, but what we, who we really want to attract is families and kids and people that don't normally go in for a bird hide. And we want people to turn the corner and go, yes, there's a building I want to go in. You know what I mean? And of course, this has got a decent green roof on it and loads of habitat on the outside. So the thing itself is a habitat. It's not zero habitat is what the other ones are, you know? And it's a place. And then we said to them, right, we want to make it a nice bright color, right? Because that's so that completely done. They went, well, you can't, no, oh God, no, you can't make it a bright color. <laughs> The birds will be scared, right? <laughs> the birds will be scared of a bright colour. You know, it's not as if, I mean, I can understand that. If it was a bright colour and then it got up and run around a lot, <laughs> you know what I mean? Then, then that would make sense, right? Birds don't worry about bright colours if it stays still. They don't. But this took, well, in fact, we didn't even get away, but we could only put the bright colour on the inside, as you could see. We had to put a green on the outside. Now, what, what, uh, you know, all I'm trying to say is all these things we need to kind of rethink and, and they can be amazing. And this now has become, and I'm, you know, I'm, uh, uh, this is probably one of the most successful things we have ever done. The Wildlife Trust are now over the moon. People want to go there. All the people that didn't, didn't like bird hides and never used bird hides are talking about this space. Now they might go in there and have a cup of tea and a cake and not look at any birds, I don't know but they want to go in there, you know what I mean? And we've now, we're now doing another fire for the wildlife trust at the back of this. And I think this is, again, it's another one, it's, it's, it's like an example of, I had this out with Barrett's once, the, the developer at a conference. And uh, she said, I said, why aren't you doing, why aren't you, why aren't you doing some houses with green roofs and, you know, interesting habitat? And why, why aren't you doing something that people, you know? She said, no, people don't want that. We've surveyed people. They only want good kitchens, good bedrooms, nice lawns blah, 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 you know what I mean? Which is probably true because they've never been given the option, have they? This is the thing. I think if Barrett's made a, they could do three quarters of their estate, bog standard, costume drama, you know, like they are, you know, it feels like you're stepping back 50 years when you go into one of their estates. And, uh, and if they did some green roof, interesting buildings, they would sell, don't you think? I think they would sell and I think they'd get more money for them, they'd get a premium for them. 
But the fact that people haven't got the option, haven't got the choice, means that it doesn't happen. And Deadwood. Um, now, again, you know, we've got enough living trees, don't you think? We've got, I mean, you know, okay, we need to plant more living trees in general, but what we haven't got enough of is dead trees. We definitely haven't. So, you know, these are, you know, there's the proportion of dead trees to live trees needs to be skewed a bit better because there's so much stuff going on in a dead tree, especially if it's still standing up. Um, so obviously leave dead trees if we possibly can that die naturally, but if not, um, take trees from a development or from anywhere else. We've got these trees are from some hedge lane that we did um, and uh, take them and uh, dig a hole and put them upright. And then you can put then you can put them where you want them, and they still do. They're not as good as having a tree that naturally dies. I understand that, but they're still good, and they're interesting. They're sculptural, and these sort of things should be integrated into our landscapes. Our new landscapes should have dead trees planted. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because these are really important, really important as a space for all sorts of things, and look beautiful, don't you think? And now this is happening, I understand, there's a posh word for this, isn't there? I always call it badly pruning trees, but there's, I think it's veteranizing trees. Is that right? Anyone here know if that's right? No, I think it is. I think that's what you call it in, when, you, when you know what you're talking about. Um, you can badly prune trees, because you know trees are really difficult to kill. Honestly, they are. I've been trying to kill, there's several trees in my garden I've been trying to kill for years. <laughs> really, really difficult. It is honestly really difficult. And if you let your, and the, the other thing about badly pruned trees is that your tree surgeon will have the best day ever. Mm -hmm. right? So the tree surgeon that came and did some of this stuff for me, I said, to him, don't worry about an undercut, let everything split, do all that. He had a feel, it was just like, a, like a, the best day of his life. Mm -hmm. And if you do those things, right? As you can see, I've had a hack at my one here. I'm not suggesting you do this in Kew Gardens, probably. Mm -hmm. And I'm not suggesting you do it in, you know, oh, there are plenty of places you could do this. And, and they, that tree will become incredibly valuable for wildlife. More, way, way, way more valuable for wildlife. I mean, let's be honest, it's a weeping willow. It's not much use for anything else. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible tree. Um, so, you know, but we need a proportion of all these things thought about and put into our new landscapes. And um, we've looked at everything right up to uh, these, 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 uh, you know the acoustic fences you get down the side of motorways and stuff, right? Loads of kilometers of that, bog standard, wooden, no habitat potential. So we've built these fences, which are eight inch posts, perforated steel fronts, perforated steel backs, and then we packed them with sand. Right? Brilliantly, brilliant from an acoustic point of view, right? And then the bees nest in them through the holes, solitary bees nest in them through the holes, and you can plant the top. Okay, so you've got three, different things going on there and it functions and it's as good if not better than than a standard acoustic fence so i think it, it's like an obsession of mine of every piece of infrastructure there's potential to 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 get plants to, to get soil to get habitat into it and this is a, another part of my garden on the right and you can see you've got probably three or four different soil types you've got um, gabions, you've got buried logs, you know, all these, the, the more complex you make the structure, the more biodiverse you will have for a landscape, definitely. And you can use railings, I mean, this is just touching on the, the housing estate, so I looked after this housing estate in Hackney for the one I was talking about earlier for 18 years, and railings, this piece of infrastructure, like railings are fantastic. You know, people always go, oh, there's too many railings in my estate. No, they're brilliant railings, are really brilliant. You can grow plants up them, you can grow plants along them. And in this case, you can grow grapevines, which we planted for the residents, which was one of the most the best things we ever did. So the Turkish and Kurdish residents, they love grapevine leaves for dolma. They absolutely love it. One of, the few, one, of the, one of the best things we ever did and the cheapest things we ever did on the estate was plant grapevines. Um, now, again, this is crossing over that thing about listening to people. This is the same estate that they, they stuck that horrible suds thing out. So, so listening to people who are on the estate, understanding what people who are living there might want, and then adapting. Now, there's, there's, bio, there's plenty of biodiversity going on when you grow food. It's still incredibly good for biodiversity. 
that incredibly difficult. But I must have just done the housing stuff. Green walls, who likes green? Hang <coughs> Hands up, anyone likes green walls? Well, I mean this type of green wall, you know, the ones that are stuck on the side of our buildings. Yeah. Now, there's a big industry, this isn't it? Loads of money in this, you know, because it's very fashionable. Everybody wants one. Um, right. What, what do you think that, I mean, you know, carbon, let's have a think about the carbon in that, right? So we've got huge pieces of galvanized still holding this stuff on. Loads of plastic window boxes on, yeah? Imported compost, loads of plants probably grown as plugs in Holland and then grown on in England, blah, blah, blah. Loads of pots. Uh, and then you put them up and then they cost uh, huge amounts of money every year to keep going, doesn't they? Right, because you've got water them all the time because they're on a vertical, they're not on a horizontal, they're on a vertical, weirdly. Um, and then when the funding runs out, they just die, don't they? Go brown. Right, and they cost all that money. So instead of that, this is what we're suggesting to architects now design a wall that's perfect for ivy. Okay, so think that oh, there's my building. Here's a wall I'm going to design specifically for ivy. So I'm going to make sure there's no little nooks and crannies so people go, ah, oh, it all gets in my soffit and fascia, the ivy I'm taking off the wall. Just design all that out, make sure the wall is specifically for ivy, and then plant an ivy at the bottom of the wall. No watering, no, you know, virtually no maintenance. And one of the best things ever for what biodiversity, ivy. Cover, makes your house warmer, makes your wall last longer, it's got flowers berries, everything, you know, is that not the best way to spend your money rather than that? Because that, you have to water that forever, forever, yeah? And then when you want to weed it, you have to get a cherry picker and go up in a cherry picker. Do you know what I mean? I mean, how, it just doesn't make, I don't get it, I don't get it. Paths is another thing you can look at as a, from a, as a, another massive potential to, to, to get habitat and, and uh, a wildlife. So uh, I love these, I use these grapes quite a bit. These are just industrial grapes. You can grow loads of stuff under them. So in other words, the path is still, you know, this is just part of your border rather than a path. And then we've just started to experiment with um, paths made out of the old school kind of hogging, which is kind of ballast um, and clay mix. Because um, what we're trying to do is to get <coughs> solitary bee nesting in the path. And then we haven't got to worry about putting sand mounds in the border. We can grow the flowers in the border, get the bees in the path because um, bees and a lot of invertebrates naturally nest in the ground on desire lives, don't they? So if anyone's interested in bees and where to find a lot of ground nesting bees, they're always uh, in the desire line that goes through fields and things because that's where people trample and that's where you get the bare soil, yeah? So that's, so we, we noticed that and we thought, yeah, that's what bees like. They like that, you know, that kind of trampled, sandy track. So you could put that straight in from the start. So we're really hoping, we only did this this autumn, so we're going to check on this and see, but I reckon bees are going to start to nest in the path. And it keeps it bare and, 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 and it keeps the vegetation out because people walk up and down it. So you get weed in for free. So every little niche, I mean, um, I remember as a kid, um, you know, there's uh, quite a few people younger than me out here today, but I mean, when we was kids, uh, Every house had house sparrows in the roof, didn't it? Or starlings or every house because all the soffits and fascias were made of wood and then they rotted and they had a hole in them. Um, now, nowadays, of course, we, it's all PVC and we don't allow stuff in. Uh, in fact, this sparrow, if you notice that, 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 that someone's installed this a bit poorly and the, there's, a, there's a kind of a fin there that's supposed to block that hole under the tile, stop him getting in there anyway. What we can do is now we can design, we can say, yeah, we'd, We'd really like you to nest in our building, Sparrow. We don't really want you above the door where you're gonna shit down the door and when you're gonna walk in. We don't want you there. We're gonna put you in a place that's the best thing because we're just gonna make a hole in the right place and we're gonna design you into our building. And uh, that's what we should be doing. And there's potential to do, to, to design niches into buildings all over them, all over them. But uh, and we can dictate where we want them. We can dictate what sort of species we're gonna get. In there. And um, I guess a lot of you have been to Dixter and a lot of you have maybe seen Fergus talking about this big survey, biodiversity survey we had done down there. Now, obviously Dixter has a massive food source, doesn't it? I mean, as an invertebrate at the bee, you'd go, yeah, man, this is, what a place this is, right? He's got, I've got flowers from January to December, basically. Yeah, and there's loads of gardeners making more and more flowers. 
So food wise, it's absolutely round, isn't it? So you'd expect there to be a fair amount of invertebrates, especially a fair amount of wildlife. But the reason that fixture is so good is because it's got that structural complexity alongside the food source, hasn't it? It's got old barns, it's got dry stone walls, it's got ancient buildings, it's got all sorts of compost heaps, disturbance from gardens. It's got all those things going on alongside the plants. Do you know what I mean? So, so the structural stuff is just as important. I'm trying to take the plants off. I'm going to have to speed up. I'm going to run out of time. Um, so it's complexity, always complexity. So what makes, the, you know, that row of gardens there are brilliant. And I know you've had Ken Thompson down, haven't you, to talk? And he will obviously have explained this. That is brilliant. And the, why is that brilliant? Because it's, the complexity has been generated by different people's tastes, hasn't it? Do you know what I mean? So this guy likes a bit of law, right? Which is great. <laughs> yeah, which is great. So the whole of his garden is long. No problem at all, because next door to him is someone who's got loads of shrubs. And next door to that, he's got someone who's got some decking with some nesting under it. Next door to that is a different taste and a different taste. And the reason gardens are so good is because of that complexity. And that's driven by our taste, isn't it? So look at that amazing amount of complexity. If you took a section of our so-called countryside, it's not even close, is it, to, to what that does? It's really not. And, and it's sandwiched between lots of houses. It's still amazing. So this is what I was supposed to be talking about, actually, from the start. <laughs> OK, so I've got three minutes left. <laughs> Shit. OK, so maybe we'll squeeze the questions a little bit. I'll just, I'll whiz through this anyway. So um, brownfield thing, brownfields are amazing, so we should learn from men. 20% of triple S eyesights are uh, on the back of mineral extraction, right? Now, that says something. We, we've gone in somewhere, we've completely smashed the pieces, and it's now the best thing for ever for, for, for one of us. Why is that? You know, because there's for one thing, there ain't a lot of topsoil knocking about. Is there chalk pits, gravel pits? Where's the topsoil? No, that's gone long gone. Yeah. And topography and complexity, all those things. You know, that's what makes it amazing. So here's a here's the highways thing. This is down near me, this is A13. Anyone heard the Billy Bragg song, A13? A13, Billy Bragg song. Great song. You should look have a look on Spotify. It's a brilliant song. So it's the main road, obviously, from London down to me and down to South End. Um, they widened it um, to uh, right near me, a couple of miles section. And when they widened the embankment, they scraped this embankment. Look at that. It's like gold dust. That is. It's this beautiful sandy bank facing south. Right? Now, we have Thames Terraces down near us, which are south facing gravelly sandy banks unbelievably important for, for invertebrates. Gold standard place, right? The council goes on about it in their, in their uh, website. You know, we are so lucky to have these Thames Terraces in Thurrock, yeah? And then they've created this, a new Thames Terrace, right? Two miles long, two miles long, and then they've chucked all the tops on them. Completely, completely done away with it. I, I mean, I, thought, I sort of thought against this, totally lost and didn't make any difference but um so if, if they'd have left that and not that that has taken away all the biodiversity well not all the biodiversity potential it's not fair but certainly and, and and you know what else would have happened of course the thames terraces are only a couple of mile away all those species would have jumped straight there wouldn't they do you know what i mean they really would anyway in the meantime the highways have changed their mind so they now, their policy now, thank God to, to Ben Hewlett and the guy who wrote this policy, um, uh, they, they won't use topsoil back on unless there's a good reason to do so. So they've made, had a major flip. This is it's incredibly important and, it, and will make a massive difference. So what I did to the, with the A13, I thought, well, okay, you're gonna cover it all in, in, in topsoil. So I knew that the haulage firm that was taking all the sand away because there was thousands of tonnes of sand that had to be taken away. So we nicked, well, we didn't nick it actually. We paid four pounds a ton and they delivered us some A13 sand. How joyous is that? It's totally joyous, it made me so happy, I can't tell you. Um, so there it all is in my garden, gradually accumulating um, and uh, amazing. So I'm on heavy clay, right? So this is a contrasting soil, obviously, to what I'm on. And within uh, no time at all, um, well, just four of, all the ground nesting bee species that I would ne that I never had 
Now, it doesn't matter how many flowers, because I do grow lots of flowers, right? It doesn't matter how many flowers I've got. I, all the species that came in on the back of this was purely because we dumped sand. I wouldn't have got those species otherwise, because the solitary bees don't fly very far from their breeding space. So this is crucial to, 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 to making that change. I better flick through this through something else. This is the sort of things we use. So we use, I go to the local um, recycling place and uh, I'm the novelty act. So I drive in and I you know, wander around looking like, you know, oh, maybe I'll try that, maybe I'll try this. Uh, I've been doing it for about 20 years now. So they know me down there. So I've tried everything they've ever done. Um, Brick waste, crushed concrete and brick, crushed ceramics, that's toilets and sinks, if you, if you want to know what that is. Um, that is one of the best materials to grow plants in. Crushed glass, crushed concrete, blah, blah, A13 sand, anything. Contaminated soil would be great if I could get hold of that. Anything like that is good from a biodiversity point of view. And, uh, you know, when you're looking at your landscape, when you're looking at your development, it's much cheaper generally to crush the material that you're gonna that you, you've taken up to do your development and keep it on site than it is to put it in a skip and take it away when you necessarily go to skip, but you know what I mean, to get rid of it and much more sensible. That can either be a soil, because crushed concrete's brilliant and grow plants in, um, or you can put it under your paddock. And someone managed before me, so Phil Sterling, anyone here come across Phil? If you haven't and you're interested in this sort of stuff, Phil is a, a genius bloke. So he managed to convince Dorset Council to, when they did the, the, the relief road, um, the bypass, sorry, he managed to convince them, well, he, he did manage to convince them to not to put topsoil on because of course they couldn't bring themselves not to. So they had to put this dusting of topsoil on because that, <laughs> otherwise it would have blown their mind. So they put 15 millimetres of topsoil on. Anyway, it was virtually none. Um, now, if you look up, this is 2009. This site now is, it'll blow your mind. It's, it's got so many species of orchid, 30 species of butterfly. I mean, just unbelievable. And feels, there's lots of stuff on, on, the, on, the, on, on the web to show this. And the, one of the other most important things, absolutely no maintenance, none. So no carbon. No, no loads of gangs of blokes streaming, no mowers, no nothing, All right? So it just ticks every box. And when you start putting this stuff, so this is my garden, this is the A13 sand. This is the, I didn't know this obviously, someone, my, my entomologist friend was very smart, told me this. The, 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 word, the pile on the right, that's glacial outwash, turns out. <laughs> so that's ballast with a bit of clay in it. And the solitary bees love it. Look, you see how many holes there is in that? That's within the first year. And these are species I never had in my garden, right? And I've just dumped a bit of sand and look what's happened. And um, these are these are uh, ivy bees, uh, which are amazing things. They turned up, you know, within the first few months. And um, of course, none of these bees are with this. Is a pantaloon bee? This is a genius thing, right? It's, it, it, one is obviously it does that thing on its one set of hairy legs, which looks really cool. And the other thing is it's the most frantic flyer. So you can see it's a pantaloon bee because it flies. It's like this kind of kamikaze thing where it flies, it just hits the flower and usually rolls over. It's flying so fast. It's just got that manicness about it, which I love. Um, anyway, these things would never have been in my garden if I hadn't had piles of sand, essentially. And then you, there's all sorts of other interesting places that obviously things like, so we scraped a bit of um, soil off here that we had down with a digger and we exposed the, the base clay at my place. And within a few months, a whole wadge of uh, uh, bee species that only like unvegetated clay on a south bank right? and one of them is called let me get this right a sharp collared furrow bee right i mean what a genius name anyway i mean as soon as they told me that's what was in there that was it then. so we made a special place for sharp collared furrow bees now and we've put them in a nice beautiful circle around them so they've got their special place and we're going to keep that relatively vegetation free so these are all bits of features and bits of design i'm not you know obviously it depends on the site and all those sort of things but you know, you, these are the things that really make a difference to the, to the ingenuity of the site. So here's where I drive. So this is the tip where I go. That's crushed toilets and sinks, and that's the plants growing in it in my house. You know what I mean? So you can see that's exactly what happened. So no organic material at all, nothing. That's the brick waste that we get from a, a, a factory. They make a lot of mistakes. They seem to have oh, loads of waste. I don't know why they're a pretty useless brick factory. They have tons of waste. <laughs> They seem to make tons of waste. What do we, we buy? Um, and the other thing that 
the totally genius thing about using mineral soils and construction waste is that you can direct sow because the material is completely weed free. Well, that's not true. It's virtually weed free. Right? So who here has tried to, you know, if you're trying to sow a wildflower meadow onto a bit of rich topsoil, one is it's not going to work on the long term probably. The two is to try and get it weed free without a chemical, for instance, if you don't want to use chemicals, is, is so, so difficult. This stuff is weed free. So you have it dumped, delivered, put down, and you can sow your seeds straight into it. And if you direct sow, you cut out pots, transport, compost. Direct sowing is way the most sustainable way to create a landscape, surely. All those other things cost money and energy and carbon, don't they? You can just have one pack of seed and do the whole space incredibly. Uh, and, 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 and using these substrates gives you the opportunity to do that. And then there's a whole uh, thing we're trying whether we put, um, for instance, if some areas have got really rank vegetation, like, you know, certain, I mean, again, creepy thistle, brilliant for wildlife. I know that, but you don't want it everywhere, do you? So there's a patch of creepy thistle. Bit of a, you can, and we've been trialing biodiversity. Uh, so biodiversity, God, I don't even like that word, and I'm using it such a lot. Uh, biodegradable uh, uh, geotextile mats, biodegradable mats. Put them down, that suppresses the creeping thistle or the rank vegetation, uh, mineral soil straight on top, and then you've got a perfect soil. Mate. Can't go wrong. Um, and these are the sort of things, I mean, for instance, the crushed concrete, that, that, that picture at the bottom, that's wild thyme. Wild thyme loves crushed concrete. Obviously it does, isn't it? Because it's a chalk downland thing and it doesn't like competition. You can't grow, well, wild thyme's a nightmare to grow, isn't it? Because you have to pick a weed around it constantly. Put it in crushed concrete, you take away the competition to an extent. These plants love it. Small scabies, another one, absolutely loves crushed concrete. Loads and loads of stuff like it. And then we've had a hookup with their industry. So this is um, chalk from um, a sugar production. So this is from Tate and Lyle in um, Silvertown, you know, the big factory there. They use the calcium carbonate chalk to filter the sugar cane. Um, and uh, then they have 11,000 tons of it a year to get rid of. So again, we, we, we're doing a lot of work with UEL now and trying to link up with industry to see what stuff they want to get rid of and whether we can use it into a landscape. Now, this is going to be genius, isn't it? It's got to be genius, you know? I mean, pure chalk is just so good for, to create meadows on and stuff. It really is. And here we are, we're going to try it on green. I reckon it'd be brilliant on green roofs as well because it's got some sugar cane in it, right? So it's got some kind of slightly sticky, it's got a bit of a bad smell to start with, but it's got this kind of sticky sort of feel to it and, and a bit more water holding. Um, so I reckon on green roofs, and they're giving this stuff away. That's the other thing, do you know what I mean? Otherwise we have to buy, uh, you got to buy a green roof substrate, it's approved. Um, it comes from miles away, we mix it miles away, we put it on a lorry, we put it in a big plastic dumpy sack, which you have to dump and, you know, the whole process is unbelievably energy -giving. This stuff is, you know, free and, and local. So I'm just going to show you a few fluffy pictures of, just to say that brownfield. So all these pictures are no organic material, no topsoil, all with construction waste and, and sand. Um, yeah, so you can see, you, can, you know, the, you, you can make things look very pretty. Yeah, and then this has got, so the bees nest in the sandy bit there. Uh, the, the spiders love the, the, the rubble. Spiders love voids and, and, and rubbly stuff. Uh, and, and the plants love the no low nutrients uh, substrates because then there's loads more of them and you don't have to weed it very much. And we do lots of, uh, do quite a few workshops and bits at our place now. And, and I was just saying earlier to Tim that uh, we found that people really do like that kind of open, sparse vegetation, that kind of look, the aesthetic of that. Now, whether it's a thing that harks back to their holidays or whether it's just a, a mindset, I don't know, whether it's just something different, but people really like that as a contrasting habitat. So if the aesthetic, you can really get to work. Uh, I better quickly get to show you this. So this is the car park at the Wildlife Trust I was talking about, um, 150 cars. This is the system, 150 cars, 2020. It was passed, right? The hunt, so the car park was passed from planning, 150 cars, no habitat, no plant, passed on the planning system. So, I mean, I didn't think that could happen, but these things still happen. They still, it's all still going along, um, which is uh, just, just terrible. Anyway, so what we said was 150 cars is too many. Right? 
don't you think? It seems a lot, doesn't it? And uh, so we said, well, we're going to have eight car parking spaces back and we're going to make them into gardens. And we're going to make sure you realise they were a car parking space by making them a car park shape. Uh, and uh, we're not going to tell planning because who, 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 who is going to, what planning officer is going to come along and say, no, take away that beautiful garden and put this car back. <laughs> it's, not gonna, it's, just, it's not going to happen, is it? You know? So, so anyway, I'm running out of time, but if anyone wants to talk to me, I can talk to them about it later. But um, essentially, we tried to make the car park into an open mosaic habitat, which is a complete contrast to the nature reserve. So the nature reserve is on clay, 200 acre nature reserve on clay, hawthorn scrub, lovely old meadows, all sorts of things, but on clay, not nothing like this. And it feels to me like biodiversity net game, if we're not careful, we're going to fall into the trap of saying, uh, you know, oh, there's the, the site had, had 50 meters of hedge. Therefore, to make it a lot better, we're going to oh, make it more biodiverse. We're going to have to have 55 meters of hedges, which is in effect what biodiversity net game kind of is, very simplistically. But all we're doing then is we're making more biomass, aren't we? We're not making more biodiversity because we're putting back a bit more of the same. If we looked at the potential of a different habitat, like an open mosaic is an incredibly important one that's under, underplayed, that I know is going to pull in loads more of species that, that this nature reserve doesn't have. So that is going to create more biodiversity, not more biomass. That's why it's so important. So I think we should, when we're looking at biodiversity again in, in general, we should not dismiss the fact that we could create a different habitat and, uh, you know, and, and, and we could pull in some, some, some different stuff. So we use local rubble, local houses in gabions, uh, 320 tonne of local houses put in gabions and then behind it, more A13 sand. So two miles from the site this was. So all these materials came from two miles away. Virtually no transport, hardly any cost. And then you can grow stuff straight in the car park as well, like the car park surface and the, and then the cars weed all the rest of it for you by driving around. So it's just a, you know, a, a, a huge potential. And that's the sort of finished thing. But we were, we were limited, obviously, because we weren't consulted or there was no talk about what the, the, the landscape was going to be when the, thing, the car park was passed. So we were squeezed into that little narrow strip in the middle and the little narrow strip around the outside because obviously they had to fit the cars in. And we had, that's, that's all the room we had. Um, so we were contributed anyway. Um, we could make it into a nice place. So I'm finishing now. This is, is more important than anything else I've been talking about, probably. If you're going to design anywhere, you've got to make sure there's maintenance for it, my God. And, you, and, and, and let's invest in maintenance and let's invest in people and gardeners that care for places rather than build a load of new stuff. That's a really good thing. And designing maintenance that doesn't require ear protection. <laughs> yeah, because all maintenance, mostly social, social housing maintenance, always ear protection. Never take them off, do you? You're either spraying, trimming or poisoning all all you can't take the things off you can't listen to the residents you can't you, you there's no joy left you know and uh that's me and this is i rather like this picture um so these guys <laughs> <laughs> so you know the stain i always use the i think there's, there's so much stuff designed and and then they come along with a stainless steel spade they take a photo and then no one looks after it you know those schemes community gardens school wildlife gardens nearly every project you can think of and this is a spade kind of sums up. In fact, they've managed, they've managed to fit three dignitaries in, only one spade. And, uh, and they won't water the tree, will they? And then when they all go, there'll be a poor bloke on nine pound an hour, you know, that might occasionally look at that. So again, it, it, it's, it's all about, it's all about all the money goes into infrastructure and doesn't go into care in different places. Uh, but that's a whole new subject. Um, that we can talk about. Um, so I have uh, complete, I even know Tim, put the clock in front of me on the seat. <laughs> <laughs> I still have managed to run when I'm done. I'm sorry, but I did stay within my uh, boundary. <laughs> Amazing stuff, thank you. I've really, really enjoyed that. I think everyone else did both sounds there. <laughs> have we got any questions from our audience today? What is biodegradable wood suppress or made of? And uh, how long it lasts? Well, they say it lasts about four to five years. Um, so it's not biodegradable. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's got to last a certain amount of time because if you're putting it on top of creeping thistle, if it doesn't last more than two or three years, it's probably going to become, it will come back through. It, it, it's going to be tricky. And, uh, and I'm not sure, you, obviously you, you probably can't predict perfectly how long it will take to degrade. Um, but it would be a really useful thing if they can get it right. Um, because obviously uh, you only want it there for a certain amount of time to just suppress what you don't want. And then once that period of time's over, the vegetation on top has taken hold of the stuff you do want and, and, then, and then you're away. So that would be a useful tool. You don't, you don't have to do that very often. It's only when obviously there's certain places where you've got that sort of vegetation, you know the sort of vegetation, bindweed, any of those things, ground elder. You, you, you know, unless you want to spray them for three years before you do something, you're probably going to be fighting them forever. So the mat does really work. And then if you put the substrate over the top and you plant into that, you can establish all the vegetation you want. And then, then that's got a good chance of competing against what might eventually come through. And we found that's really a very cost effective way of looking at that stuff. Fantastic. Uh, what would you grow in crash ceramics? Oh, crash ceramics is my favorite thing because what crash ceramics is, it's when they fire the ceramic, they fire it at such a high temperature, the clay, and again, this is me guessing, but to an extent, um, it doesn't become claggy. So the clay doesn't become claggy. It's still got some water holding, but it doesn't become like sticky clay. And the ceramic and, and the glazing becomes the perfect horticultural grit. You know, you know that kind of shape of horticultural grit, but that's what the glazing looks like. So you've got the combination of the clay that doesn't become sticky and the horticultural grit. Genius. And uh, the only snag is it's pretty alkaline. But um, again, you know, a bit of stress in plants doesn't do any harm on the heart. So it's a, a fairly alkaline, but we've used it for many, many years and it is it, it's amazing, really perfect for, for uh, establishing stuff. Do you have a book? booklet summarizing all this and if you do when is it coming out uh, well i've been talking i mean i would never be able to write a book but i kind of i thought i wrote a book on green rooms a while back but um it was agony um so <laughs> I, I i won't be able to do it but i've teamed up with someone who really likes to write stuff down um and uh we, there's a good chance that um uh, we're going to be able to uh, we're going to start on that we want to we want to write a very practical handbook I, i've got in my head it's going to be a ring binder thing that people that landscape architects might be able to have on the desk and just flick through and we'll have natural habitat on one page what it looks like man-made and how you can mimic that with man-made materials on the other page uh, and 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 some and an idea of how, how to look after it and rough you know a, a guess at how much it might cost yeah do you think then that you can tell RHS that because when you do your RHS and say I've got a plateau, do all these other things, and you're basically saying the opposite. You think you can sell your book to the RHS, they can change. Well, I'm not, I'm not, as I said right at the start, I am in no way suggesting that we should obviously we don't want to get rid of topsoil. It's not, you know, it's, it's incredibly important, but I just don't think we need it everywhere. And I don't think it needs to be put back on top of landscapes when it's been taken away. When we that's when we've got the choice. No, I'm not suggesting we go in and, and just take all the topsoil away and, and, and I'm not. I'm suggesting that on the back of development and on the back of landscaping where the topsoil is already removed, that's the time to make that choice. And then you can incorporate materials from the site of, and materials from the development into your landscape. Because I, I have this kind of, I have to say, I have a dream then. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I have, I have this thought that uh, like when you make, say you're making a, a cycle path, you make the cycle path, you put the sub base down for the cycle path, and you say the cycle path is 1500 wide, I don't know. You make, six, you make it 600 mil wider either side, extend the sub base out, right? So you've got all those materials on site. The digger guys can do all that. Tarmac the, si the, the cycle path, or whatever you're going to do. Just leave the sub base out of the side, right? And then give uh, 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 the digger driver the packet seed, and he can get out of his cab and he can make the new landscape with a packet seed. Now, I know that sounds, you know, but that would work. And then you've used, you, you, you've done the landscaping at the construction phase for minimal cost and no extra carbon, virtually no extra carbon, because the materials are on site, the machinery is on site, all the, a lot of the landscaping stuff could be done within the construction phase 
with with the help of obviously of a good landscape architect, with the, have a landscape architect in port and, and in at the construction uh, stage, uh, because that's when you've got all the machinery on site already. You know, and is there a specific ID you'd recommend planting? Uh, I think, I mean, you, you, I mean, obviously the native ivy is brilliant, but there's no reason why you can't use any ivy that, that essentially flowers and fruits. If it flowers and fruits mm. and, and sticks to a wall, then yeah, why not? I mean, I, I just think they're, they're a genius plant. I mean, they, they literally, I can't think of anything they, they do, they don't do for wildlife, you know, protection. You get that lovely dryness behind the leaves, don't you? It's, it's a great place for hibernation. Um, and then you get a massive food source at a time of year when no, nothing else is flowering and a brilliant source of berries at the end. So, Another question, what is the minimum depth you could do a green reef? Uh, okay, <laughs> well, um, I'd, say, I'd say if you could possibly get to 150 mil, that, that's a really, that's, that gives you a chance to go and do a decent reef. But the other thing to remember about a, a green reef, you can use topography to make it more interesting that's the other thing so you can you can mound the soil up above the the uh, retaining walls where the loading can be more and you can thin it out in the center of the span so you can get 300 mil on the sides and 50 mil in the middle and then you can put some rubble in the middle you say and the other thing to think about green roofs because you call it green um it, it's not all about plants because again on a, on, a, on a green roof you've got potential to have that structural stuff on a green roof alongside the plants which will make it way better for biodiversity. Uh, are there any specific deadwoods which are better than others to use? Uh, well, I'm guessing, you know, if you had the luxury of oak, that would be really nice. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm suggesting probably that off the back of developments and anything else where there was trees taken out, you'd have to take what you could get. Um, but anything stood upright and left to rot, it's always going to be good. Always going to be good. We'll go for a few more, yeah. If someone was, was to ask you what sort of garden you had, how would you describe what you create? I'd say it would be. Um, I'd say it's a it's it's a garden that delivers that delivers wildlife and habitat without losing the aesthetic. Right. That that that's for me. You know, I'm I'm people always think because I'm interested in in so called wild. Uh, gardens that I'm, a, you know, I'm a messy bugger, right? Well, I am a bit, but I, I, I'm quite obsessive about the neatness alongside the wildness because neatness gives you wild. You know, if you don't have the neatness, you can't get the wild stuff into urban places. And and, it, and it's a respectful. It, it's, it's you know, you shouldn't have the arrogance to think you can do that. Right. And, and in high summer, it's the fields of Mediterranean. Like a gravel garden. I, I, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, obviously, we mix up topsoil areas. We do have topsoil areas alongside, yeah. and sometimes I'll do uh, like circles of topsoil in amongst the poorer um, soils. I think it was also driven by me. I, you know, I'm coming up to sixty. I had three different businesses and a four-acre garden. There's no way I could, and, and and at that time, no garden, so I couldn't actually deliver a garden yeah. that, that, that had that kind of flower mix without reducing the fertility of the soil because that allows you to garden it's a really lovely thing because it gives you more time you don't have that kind of frantic weeding thing because you, you you've just got that little bit of space and of course i'm on heavy clay and i'm putting lovely loose sand on top which is easy to take the plants out and weed <laughs> so there's a certain amount of that could well go around. you know um I know there's, um, we also sometimes refer to it as stress tolerant plants that you're introducing. So you, you induce stress and then you allow plants that would not normally be there to then grow, that would be normally overtaken by your normal garden plants that love the nutrients. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you introduce, as soon as you put, uh, uh, as soon as you, the more, essentially, the more organic material, the more maintenance, the more work. I mean, it literally is a virtual direct correlation. Um, and uh, I think you just need, you need both, don't you? You need beautifully rich, fertile soils and you need um, those other soils as well. And I, from my point of view, the reason I'm so, so uh, uh, keen on, on, on the, the lower fertility soils is it's, it, it might allow me to put the complex, beautiful, diverse uh, colors and plants into a social housing estate, for instance. You know, it's like a cheap Dixter border. You know, it's like, I, I want the Dixter thing, but I haven't got 20 gardeners. 
So, uh, you know, if you if you reduce the fertility, you can get that diversity of plants with obviously much lower maintenance. Not no maintenance, and there should be more maintenance. But it, it, but you can you've got you've got a chance, I guess. Uh, well, I'll go for one more. <laughs> Any of the ways crushed aggregates work um, well for hard stem surfaces? Any other ways crushed aggregates work? Oh, you mean, what do they mean? Do they mean underneath a hard surface? I think above. Above, okay. Right. <clears throat> well, one of the standard paths I use is I, I use a, a steel edging, so 100 mil by 5 mil thick steel edging. If you want a curved path, you get those beautiful curves, really cheap. Um, and then I use crushed concrete as a base. And then I put a little bit of granite fines. This is one of my compromises to uh, mine the material. So granite fines. Um, put that on top and then you get like virtually a disabled uh, smooth surface that you can get disabled access for and it's just quite nice to use and you only have to use about 20 30 mil on top of your crushed concrete or you can just leave it crushed concrete it's just a bit rougher so.